Hi, uh, Tom, Dr. Tom McKean of Elphiston Institute of Aberdeen U University. Can you just introduce yourself a wee bit more and tell us what and where is Elphiston Institute? Well, I'm Tom McCain, director of the Elphinstone Institute, as you say. The Institute was founded by the university in 1995 to research, celebrate and promote the traditions of Northeast Scotland. It was seen that the university, um, while it has an international reach, sometimes wasn't interacting sufficiently with, its, with the region in which it finds itself, you know, that makes it a distinctive institution. So it was important for um, the people at the time in celebrating the 500th anniversary of the university to really make connections with the with the community. So for the last 25 plus years, the Institute has been working on um, the culture of Northeast Scotland in research terms and doing community engagement projects, um, reviving, celebrating old and new traditions. That's lovely, Tom. Tom, what, what is your role in the Institute? Well, I'm the director, so um, I go around bossing people and telling everybody what to do, um, <laughs> which, which they're off a thran, so they didn't do at all. Um, but, uh, well, I think I just sort of steer the institute in the directions uh, that I think are, are good for the community and for the university. And for me, that's really about, as I said, making connections between the university and the community and working in partnership with uh, local organizations and individuals to celebrate the wonderful diversity of tradition that there is here. And when I say tradition, I don't necessarily mean old, you know, 19th century plowing terms, but living traditions of music, song, story, um, both kind of what you might call local or indigenous, but also the rich variety of, um, of people who now live here in the Northeast. So bringing traditions from their own parts of the world, from the Polish tradition, Lithuanian tradition, um, Indian, Pakistani traditions, lots of, of wonderful mixtures. You know, Aberdeen is, is among, if not the most diverse city in the UK. Um, and so there's a huge range of interesting traditions and practices uh, to celebrate. And all of it, for me, grounded in this wonderful oral tradition of the northeast of Scotland, from the language Doric Northeast Scots to the music and song and story of the ballads and bothy songs and fiddle music, all manner of traditional arts like that. Tom, you have got a lovely way of imparting your enthusiasm for uh, the culture here in the northeast of Scotland. And I love the way that you just said, Sran, Sran. <laughs> It just came right from the back of your throat there, Tom. Tom, a little bit about your background, because it doesn't sound as though you actually come from the Northeast originally. Where have you come from um, originally, Tom? And uh, what has brought you to this corner, to this nook of the Northeast, Tom? Well, I do come from the Northeast, uh, but the Northeast of the United States. Um, born and raised in Massachusetts and then in New Hampshire and New York City. So half country loon and half city city fella, um, but I originally came to tradition um, through my family. A lot of my family members sing, and I was always interested in all ways and um, farm tools and old ways of doing things. Um, and in New Hampshire, my mother uh, comes from um, a very rural part of New Hampshire. So we, we did things like sugaring, making maple syrup, um, cutting wood for the fires and all that kind of thing. Um, so that rural part of my background informed the sort of interest in, in farming and old traditions. Uh, the city part of my background in, in sort of dynamic culture. Uh, and so that all comes together really when you talk about folklore, which is really how people make sense of the world around them through music and song and story. The stories we tell each other, you know, just down the, down the pub or in the home on a, on a Friday night, the stories that we tell each other, they're not great big folk tales. They're not international folk tales, but they're how we communicate is storytelling. You know what happened to me yesterday? This amazing thing. And wait till you hear that sort of thing. So the stories we tell each other is really how we communicate culture and, and ways of getting through the world. So you know, I just, yeah. with that interest in... Yeah, Tom, I was just going to say there Sorry? that... 
you're 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 interested in the land and land landward things and a basic a basic grounding you know on, from the land i think that draws a lot of people in into culture you know and we're just so glad that you've come from your neck of the world to, <laughs> to the northeast tom because it's all relevant it doesn't matter where you come from originally it's all relevant we are here we're in this um Doric speaking uh, culture uh and uh, you know in the northeast tom and it, it's just as you say it's so exciting because we're a mixed we're a mixed lot now hey eh, tom tom i was just gonna ask you there you know you you, you host in um, courses at the elphiston institute um can you tell us a wee bit about the the courses that you host at elphiston and they're relevant to the northeast culture and language eh, tom well the main uh the main course we do is a, a postgraduate degree and a master's in folklore and ethnology and that's a year-long course where students learn um, how to do field work, how to do interviewing, how to archive their materials, and then how to write an interesting dissertation or an article, uh, whether it be for a newspaper or an academic journal, about their work, about what they've discovered. And all of our work focuses really on the individual, the experience of the individual. So whereas a, a history department or a literature department might be looking at the big things, you know, they look at Shakespeare or they look at the treaty of this or that. We look at individual experience and, and interview a lot of um, people who maybe think their, their own experience is not that significant. But in fact, when you look deeply into somebody's own experience, that's really, for me, the kind of truth of, of human experience. And really, the individual can only tell truth about themselves, you know? So when you do an in-depth interview with somebody, they're telling you something very true about humanity. And so, as I say, all of our work is based on that kind of interviewing. And collectively, when you put those collective experiences together, then you get a really, a really rich picture of a community or a group uh, or a region like the Northeast. Uh, so this Masters in Folklore and Ethnology gives you that, the sort of technical side of how to do this work but also uh, you come to grips with um, the traditions of the Northeast, the customs and the beliefs and the, the ballads and the, the Bothy songs. And we learn some about Gaelic song as well. Of course, Gaelic is a, an important part of Scottish culture as well uh, and music, song and story. Um, so there's, there's kind of the, the mechanisms of how to investigate culture and then this, the content of what is culture all about and how do people make sense of the world around them. And we also offer a couple of undergraduate courses, uh, one in oral traditions of Scotland, of the Northeast in particular, but Scotland generally. And then we have just launched um, a course in Doric, an introductory mm -hmm. language course in Doric and Northeast Scots. And that's a 12 week undergraduate course can be taken alongside, you know, like any other language course, like introductory German, introductory French, introductory Italian. So it's really looking at the language um, uh, through its its history, uh, its sociological importance, its um, the sort of technical side of its syntax and vocabulary, and the ways in which it's a distinctive language. And students learn to read and write uh, and do some listening comprehension. Uh, as just like any other language course again and, and it's it's a real interesting way to to bring Doric to a, a different completely different audience you know and maybe half the students were folk with some cognizance of of northeast Scots Doric and the other half were folk visiting from other countries and you know you can go to any country in the world Portugal Spain Brazil wherever and you can find a language course to help you learn the language of that country. And I have had international students coming to me for years saying, how come I can't go and learn Doric anywhere? Because everybody around here speaks Doric or some, some form of it in their speech. Uh, and so we're trying to answer that need as well um, so that people coming in can learn more about it. And of course, people who come to work here from Poland or Lithuania do um, learn Doric in their working lives and they use it every day. Um, and so it's, I think, an interesting addition so that people can learn it in a formal way. And we're gonna be launching that online um, this autumn as well. So anybody anywhere in the world or throughout the Northeast um, can, can take the course online and learn a bit. Um, you know, even if they're native speakers, even if they've grown up speaking it, they might learn a little bit about how it's the sort of technical side of its, of, um, 
its formation as a language and its relationship to other languages. And if you're an absolute beginner, then you learn slightly different aspects, but we hope to cater to lots of different audiences, you know, curious about the language and the culture that goes with it. Well, Tom, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to book myself onto that course, Tom, <laughs> because there's a lot of folk like me, um, you know, Tom, who, who were basic uh, Doric country um, speakers, some Fisher uh, speakers as well. Obviously, we're next to the North Sea, so you've got a real mix here. Um, and, you know, but I think what's uh, happened to a lot of us uh, along the way, Tom, is because our forefathers um, are no longer here, we would have spoke all the time when I was a little bear in, 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 in Doric because we engaged, we were, in, we were firm and folk. So there was all a lot of uh, technical things happening on the farm and, you know, you'd have been showing noops in one season and you'd have been doing the hearse in the next season. You know, and, you know, since my parents have gone, you know, and I'm not engaged with farming, these words, these technical words of farming, they're not required in my vocabulary because I've got nobody to, to speak them with. So therefore, I'm losing them, Tom. I'm losing them. And I just think, and it's only since I started this Doric Future and the Doric TV thing, I'm thinking, wait a minute, there must be so many people like myself who are from a Doric background, but, you know, we don't, we're not engaging in the, the dialect, the language anymore, because we're a multicultural, you know, uh, we live in offices, we work in offices or whatever, you know, and in shielding like I am. Uh, Tom, well, you've got nobody to speak to. Uh, so therefore, um, you know, you're, we're not practicing it. So we're losing, we are losing the words and we're losing our ability to, to, to get the words coming instantly, right? But to, and to form them in sentences because you, when I was younger, you didn't think about it, Tom. It came automatically and it's like any language. If you don't use it, you lose it. And I think that's been my experience and a lot of people's experience, say, Tom, but only too delighted there is an organized, you know, institute, the Elphiston Institute, who are keeping all this going. And the courses, Tom, are so important. That course, your online course, um, this is actually a good promotion for it, Tom. I'll be engaging in it, Tom, definitely. Tom, um, you know, um, this same... Um, the Doric Future a website, the domain and the Doric TV domain that we, me and myself, Gordon, have been working on this last year and a bit. How important is it for individuals like myself who are working outside the university but in, engaging with yourselves to be able to bring our material forward? I think I've got about 100 interviews now or 100 videos, over 100 videos, all to do with the here and now, um, you know, in this part of Aberdeenshire and, and Buchan. How important is, is it to the Elphiston Institute for people bringing their material for archiving, eh, Tom? Well, it's really essential. I mean, the, the Institute is, you know, it's a small institute. We do what we can do. Um, <clears throat> but we also, of course, follow what we want to do. But when we work in partnership with people like yourself or with... Um, Jim Taylor up in Fraserburgh, Andrew Davidson, who's made a wonderful Fraserburgh on film site, you know, in working with community groups and individuals like yourself, then we really get a much better sense of what the community wants, what's important to the community. I can sit in an office and decide what I think is important, and that's valid, but I don't want to impose that on other people. So part of, part of our work is going to speak with folk like yourself about what you think is important and reflecting that those priorities in you know, shaping what we do. So in, in fact, we're just about to embark on a consultation, a, a community consultation where we'll be asking people like you, um, you know, what challenges do you see ahead for, for yourself and for your organization and for the culture? And what are the ways in which the Institute might be able to help? Not saying that we can help everybody with everything, but we want to be responsive and doing the sorts of work that people find valuable, not just mm -hmm. think, that I, sitting in a closet, think are good things to do, but things that actually make a difference to the community, you know. Um, so I think it's important to, um, to work with partners, and we always have for the last 25 years worked with, in partnership with individuals and organizations to make things happen that, that communities want and need, mm -hmm. rather than necessarily be lobbing something over the wall and say here you go here's something nice for you <laughs> <laughs> i know i think my experience when i started doing oral histories well oral history is one of the things i do we've now gone on to direct tv which is you know a zoom interviews because obviously me being in shielding rights i can't really get out and about at this present time 
But the, when I started doing oral history, actually, actually interviewing people in my own community, I got a tremendous response, Tom. It, to me, it was heartwarming. You know, um, you know, all across the board, uh, people wanting to engage and telling their story, you know, telling their history, whether it be their own personal history or the history of the village that, uh, that they live in. And I'm based in Creedon Bay here. And, you know, I found the response was just great, Tom, because especially for the older members of the community, Tom, who knew, who know that their stories are fading away and they want to bring them forward so that their families have a record because families don't normally say, well, I'll sit and interview you, mum or dad, for, you know, for the fu for future posterity. That doesn't happen. My one regret is I didn't interview my own dad. I'll let it go. But, you know, Fairman folk, weren't they, they weren't even good at being interviewed, Tom. <laughs> They were so busy. I've done my share. I've done my share of interviewing Fairman folk, and they're they're busy, as you say, and you have busy. to follow them around sometimes, asking <laughs> questions. Uh, but I think I think you draw some you know important attention to people telling their stories to others, and it's it's in some ways not so much about what they're actually telling you, but it's that relationship mm. of interacting with them. And when you speak to older folks in the village or anybody in the village, and you get them to tell their story, people feel valued. They feel mm like yeah. they're part of something yeah and it's really that relationship that you build up with the interviewee uh and that's what's that's what's so important about culture is those relationships whatever stories whatever the actual content is um is maybe not as important as the relationships and so that's what the sort of thing you're doing you know with the community interviews is so important because it makes everybody feel like they're part of part of something and that's really important for everybody's self-esteem and mental health uh, and physical health is feeling part of something bigger than just sitting watching a tv screen you know it's so much more important to to have those human interactions I think you're right Tom because I mean I could spend I could spend every day of my life just uh, doing oral history and, and, and capturing people in their own homes out in the community, you know, but it is a very time consuming thing. There's no doubt about it, Tom. You, you just can't set yourself up and say, well, okay, tell me your story. You've got to, you've got to know the person. You've got to get to know the person a bit better. You've got to know what questions to ask. Um, and, you know, and then you've got to go back and let them see the material as it's, you know, and make sure that it's okay. And then you sit there after 10 cups of tea. <laughs> oh, you think, oh gosh, I know. And then before you know it, that's probably a two or three days work just to do, to, to capture one person. But you know, Tom, I wouldn't not do this, Tom, because it is so rewarding. It is so rewarding. When I see people's faces, when they see the recorded interview that they've done and they've said, I've done it, I've done it. It's out there forever. You know, I just think, oh, I just, it's, it's a pleasure to do, Tom. And I think, you know, when you think about it, and I always say to people that, you know, we have um, technology nowadays, digital technology, that we will be seen and heard in a hundred years time, hopefully 500 years time. That's mind boggling, Tom. It's because, very strange, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, you know, because, uh, you know, the written history is the written history, which is great, but the oral visual and audio history is something that is, it, it, it's just so it's so valuable and um, people you know we can't see further back in Sydney what a hundred years Tom a hundred years we can't we have no record moving record other than the Sydney which was taken a hundred years ago right we now are in a great place our material our people our voices will be projected in centuries to come and I just think wow yeah, I think the, the story that we can tell as the Institute and you as Doric TV, the story that we can tell our children and grandchildren, and great grandchildren is, is much more democratic with a small d, you know, than than past stories which have been written by governments and landowners and all that, you know, there's much more the story of the individual um, ordinary folk making their way in the world. And that's the story that you and we are help, helping to tell and helping people tell themselves the way they want to tell it as well. I think that's, that's really important for, for communities. Yeah, and it's the, way, it's the way they're telling the story, I think, as Tom, is, is really important. You know, I also think visual, facial, facial features is really important to record because I'm looking at some of the older senior members of the community, you know, and if I think about my dad's face, the way that his 
the shape to space. The land is shaped as the space. The culture has shaped to space. The genetics has shaped to space. But in in decades to come, our and the language, the sounds of the language as well. Our face is going to change, mm -hmm. eh, Tom. Therefore, the faces of today might not be the same sort of structure in the northeast facial structure in a hundred years time. So I think it's so important to get the the you, people's looks, how we look today, how we look today, yeah, and how we act and interact with the the, you know, Tom, the importance of this eh, retaining our culture and dialect here in the northeast. How important is it? How important is it in a wider scale? Well, in my experience, um, both here in Scotland and in America, when people have a sense of themselves, a sense of location, um, a sense of confidence about themselves and their culture and their language, then they're much more able to be welcoming of others and to go elsewhere in the world and value other cultures. When people start feeling insecure um, and like maybe their culture isn't worth as much as somebody else's, then they get very defensive and sometimes very aggressive. But I think if people are comfortable in themselves, comfortable in their culture, comfortable in their language and believe that it is rich, it is worth something, it is valuable, then they're much more, as I say, confident to go elsewhere and be elsewhere and interact with other people and share the beauties and joys and sadnesses and tragedies of their cultures and their experience without having to be defensive in any way. So for me, it's a much, it's, it's really how communities survive and it's how I think as a species, we will get through um, if we are able to interact with others with confidence and with assurance um, and a sense of, of joy and tragedy related to our language and culture and, uh, and our experience. So it really gives access, I think, to the full range of human experience here. So they often say that um, Scots think in English but feel in Scots. So feeling in Doric, uh, but thinking or expressing yourself in the workplace, you know, through the medium of English. And if we can draw those two things a little more closely together to help people feel confident to use their Doric Northeast Scots in the workplace um, and take that confidence with them as they move throughout the world, then I think, I think we're onto something. So that's why I think Doric and um, Northeast culture and being grounded and rooted in something you know, it doesn't have to be this one, but for obviously for people in this area, it's important to be rooted here in some way. Um, but equally as a New Englander, it's important for me to be rooted in New England culture. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and when I have confidence in that, then I'm able to come here and, and appreciate other people's confidence in their culture. So I think oh. it really helps interchange and understanding in a big way. Tom, that's beautifully put. You know, I could sit and listen to you all day, Tom. I could, I could, I could sit and listen to you all day. And I think that's why you I'm do. I'm not crying. You didn't want to do that. <laughs> well, well, I'm here to do this afternoon. <laughs> I'm going to do another interview. You, Tom, and you're singing, your music playing, and your your storytelling. Tom, we could, uh, you know, we'll have to engage Nick and another time, Tom. Tom, right. you know, that's why, that's why you do what you do. That's why, you, that's why everybody in, El, in Elphiston, and I know it's not just the, the staff that work in Elphiston, you've got a whole lot of people engaged in Elphiston. You have brought a whole lot of people on board um, on Elphiston. You know, that's why I'm taking my material to you, Tom, because I've got faith in that you will archive all the material that I've done because it's a lot of hard work and it's a lot of people's time and effort. And, you know, and it's just to say to close, uh, Tom, you know, when it, my, the material, the historians um, that I, work that I've done at the Syrian Buchan, when it goes to be archived in the Elphiston University, what, what happens to it briefly, John? What happens to it? Well, it's um, usually part of a specific project and we need to find funding for the cataloging side of things. I suppose the first thing is preservation, you know, digital preservation on redundant servers. So there's, you know, there's a server somewhere in space or South Dakota or somewhere with backups of the materials uh, as well as the university servers. So it's safe that way. 
You know, yeah. it's, it's um, safe if somebody's computer dies, then the material is still there somewhere and can be recopied. Uh, and the other question is access, you know, all the, all the required data that's necessary um, to find out what's on the recording, because you can, you know, you can look at a digital file and you think, what the heck is that? But if you don't have the information about who and when and where to yeah. go with it, then uh, you need that to make it useful. Yeah. And then, of course, you need permissions uh, from yeah. the people who took part for it to be archived and to, for researchers to come and use it or maybe the BBC, if they're doing something about Northeast culture, you know, find a, a snippet of something and, of course, for teaching as well. Um, so preservation, access and permissions uh, so that it's all ethical and and the people who you've you know who've given you their valuable time and yeah. insights um, are happy with what's happening with the material. Yeah, Tom, that is perfect because that helps um, our <clears throat> our viewers to know what um, what will happen to their material. And for anybody that we've still to record an interview, you know, it gives them a great insight as well, Tom. So I can't wait to get out of shielding and out with my little. A little camera again to to be out there in the community because that's what I do best and that's what I love doing, Tom. Tom, we cannot be thank you all the work that you're doing at Elphiston Institute and all the people that you're taking on board and you're enthusing enthusing about our northeast culture and dialect here in Scotland. Tom, thank you so much. I've been so um, longing for you to come on the Adriatic TV and here you are. You know the stars in my the stars in my book aren't the ones that you see up there and lights are in TV, Tom. The stars for my book are those that work a while and then they're in their own hearts. They're looking at the bigger picture and things and how we can help human humanity along in this day and age that we're living in. Tom, keep in touch. Yeah, and if any of your if any of your viewers um, are interested in what we do at the Institute um, or would like to volunteer to do some work with us um, or are interested in partnerships, please get in touch. We're always open to speaking with folk. Speaking with folk. That's what we do best, Tom. Tom, thank you. We'll meet again, Tom. Bye.